New York is the 2nd of June 2006. Approximately 1 p.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Well, my name is John Doherty Alden. Uh, Branch of Services, U.S. Navy. Okay, when and where were you born? Born in San Diego, 1921. Okay, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Well, I was in college at the time I signed up at the Cornell University. And I signed up immediately after Pearl Harbor as soon as they, they established a V7 unit at the, the, at the school. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did finish up, uh, graduated. They called us in about a month ahead of normal graduation, but uh, my group all got their degrees. Mm -hmm. Now, what was a V7 unit? V7 was, was a program that uh, you signed up as an apprentice seaman in the Naval Reserve, unpaid, and you were allowed to finish your degree. Mm -hmm. And then you go on into active duty. Okay, well, now why did you pick the Navy? Well, I was in a Navy family. My, my father had been in the Navy. I just thought I was interested okay. in the Navy. And I see. I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was right at, uh, at the university. Mm -hmm. I guess we were studying or loafing or something a Sunday afternoon and I heard, heard the news on the radio, hard to believe it. Mm -hmm. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was at all? Oh, sure. Did you? Okay. Yeah, I'd lived in Hawaii. Oh, okay. Yeah. So a lot of people had, had never even mm -hmm. heard of it. But, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, when you uh, left Cornell, then you, you went right into the Navy. Where did well, you? they immediately sent us to a midshipman school, mm -hmm. which was a three-month school, and I was sent down to Columbia University in New York City. And while I was there, after the, the first month, you would apprentice seaman. And then uh, if you passed that part, you became a midshipman for the next two months. Well, just about the time I had become a midshipman, I got real sick and was sent to a hospital and was there so long I fell behind the class. So I got sent to a, 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 up to Notre Dame to uh, another midshipman school. So that's where I finished up and got uh, commissioned. Okay. Um, where did you go from no, after you well, uh, became a midshipman? I kept applying for submarine duty, but when I, when I got out of uh, Notre Dame, they sent me back to Cornell to diesel school, which was the last place in the world I wanted to go. But uh, anyway, I was back there for about five months and uh, went through the course in diesel engineering and then uh, finally got ordered to Southern Green School. Mm -hmm. So it's just been uh, just one school after another. And uh, while I was at, at New London, I, Got there about, oh, it was, must have been a month before the next uh, sub-school class was going to start. So they put me right on the submarine where I got some real good experience. And then I went into sub-school for three months and then uh, I stood high enough that I got my first choice, a duty, which was to a new submarine out in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. And that one was not going to be commissioned for another month or so, so they put me on another school school boat um, out in New London. So I got real good uh, mm -hmm. good initial training working with, uh, it happened to be a, a, a boat that was training prospective commanding officers. So I met a lot of people back from the Pacific that had had plenty of experience. Then. Uh, while I was at sub-school and my wife and I got married, we drove out to Manitowoc and joined the, the crew of the submarine out there, the Lamprey, and uh, finally went into commission. We trained on Great Lakes. 
and then they put the put the boat down through the uh, Chicago drainage canal and the Mississippi River down to New Orleans. And from there we went to uh, down through the Panama Canal, did some more advanced training there, and out to Pearl Harbor, and a little more training, and on to Saipan, stopped and topped off uh, fuel, and then finally got off into the war zone. Now when was that approximately? By then it was early 1945. It was about March before we finally got out into the, mm -hmm. you know, really into the war zone. Now, what were your duties on the, on the submarine? I was a communications officer on that one, mm -hmm. communications and electronics. Mm -hmm. Now, were there any problems with the lamprey at all, or with it being a new boat? Were there any problems no, we, at all? It was a very well built sub, mm -hmm. and you know, we didn't. I don't remember any problems at all. Oh. Yeah, other mm -hmm. than well, you always had normal problems. Mm -hmm. We had, well, as a story, you know, we, we would do our deep, <coughs> initial deep dive out on Lake Michigan, which was pretty deep. A uh, deep dive to get down to 600 feet. And uh, a uh, inspecting team had come from the East Coast, from, from New London. And uh, when you get down that deep, there's always some, some leakage around things. There's a little seepage coming around the periscope mast or the radar mast or one of those. And, and the commander from the, from the Groton reached up fresh water. It's condensation. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it probably was anyway. <laughs> It was a little different to diving in fresh water. Yes. <laughs> you had to re-ballast the, the boat when you got into salt water. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Yeah. So anyway... Um, what was your first patrol like? First patrol, uh, our skipper was, a, was an experienced, uh, older, <coughs> older man that had had a previous boat. And they did this deliberately to take uh, the, the initial first patrol by that time of the war, they, they put an experienced, more conservative type officer in charge to break the crew in. And uh, we went uh, from Saipan, we went just north of, of the Philippines, between the Philippine Islands and Formosa, and did primarily lifeguard duty at first. And then they sent us. Now, what do you mean by lifeguard duty? Well, that's when the when the bombers were, mm -hmm. were flying from uh, Saipan and Guam, the shuttles up to the, to uh, Japan, heavy bombing. And uh, if they had to ditch, they had submarine stationed all along. At that time of the, of the war, that was was the main the main duty for subs because they pretty well wiped off the Japanese merchant ships. Did you ever have to pick up any down flyers? No. No, they didn't ditch near us. Okay. I, I would, t would talk to them on the voice radio when they went over. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think we heard one that was down, but it was, it was not in our area. But of course, that's where George Bush got picked up when he went down. So from there we, uh, we went down into the South China Sea, we went in close to Hong Kong. Uh, didn't ever spot anything except a bunch of fishing junks. And then we were ordered down through the Java Sea and down to uh, Fremantle, Australia, Western Australia. And we, there we had a a two-week rest period, and they got a new captain, young fella, more aggressive. And uh, got some new, uh, some new equipment. They're constantly getting new equipment during the war, replacing uh, the deck guns with better ones, and replacing the electronics, improving it. So we went back up through. Uh, 
and Parramatta Strait to Lombok Strait first, which was uh, between the islands of, of uh, Bali and Lombok. It's a very narrow strait. And there's quite a current. You'd be, it's always coming down through it, a tidal current. And the uh, Japanese on both sides, so submarines, as we came down from, from the north, we just coasted through underwater. But going up uh, in the northerly direction, we had to stay on the surface in order to have an, you know, enough speed and mm -hmm. power to overcome that current. So it was, a, it was a, a kind of a tricky place. And a little after we went through another boat that got lost there, Japanese uh, airplane. <coughs> so we then went, to, got up into in the Java Sea, and that was our, uh, our patrol area. One of the first things we encountered, we uh, we were off, uh, was off of Batavia. They don't call it Batavia anymore, but that's what it was then. And we encountered a, a small Japanese ship. It turned out it was a submarine chaser. We chased it. <laughs> and uh, as we were shooting at it, another one of our subs popped up right next by. It turned out it was the, the, the bluefish. And we exchanged uh, calls with them, of course. And we were both firing at this, this uh, little Japanese sub-chaser. We both claimed to have hit it, but he turned tail and went away. And uh, anyway, while we were there shooting at him, this was another one of the more interesting occasions we had that uh, our captain was up on the bridge, and where the, where the deck phone was, and the executive officer was in the conning tower, and I was in the conning tower at, at the radar. And actually, my, my <coughs> battle station was the assistant to the torpedo data computer operator, the one that can control the torpedoes. It had nothing to do with the guns. And anyway, we were watching. You could see that the shells on the on the radar could track them, and uh, our exec was getting getting kind of. Uh, he says, what, what, "What are we doing, Captain? And, uh, are, are we hitting them or something like that?" And Captain says, "Well, Bill, and he's shooting back. Well, well, some of them are come, they're going over us, and some of them are, are falling short. You go, Let's get the hell out of here." <laughs> <laughs> But that was not a very good position to be in, really. <laughs> anyway, we, that was, was the, the sole gun experience I had. The, the only other one we, uh, on that same patrol, we, 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 we followed some kind of a Japanese ship. We weren't sure what it was. It might have been a, a DE or a landing ship of some sort. Anyway, we kept chasing him, and he went up a river in Borneo, and we finally uh, went in backwards and, and shot uh, three torpedoes out of the stern tubes, but we missed him. But th that's all we did. We were chasing the anti-submarine ships instead of the other way around. It's, that's <coughs> all it was. The only other action we had, we stopped a number of junks and uh, small. <coughs> Mostly native craft. If they had any anything looked like Japanese goods on them, we'd take the people off and sink them. But we did sink a couple. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they were just tiny little ships. Now, how long? Then we had to get rid of the crew, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'd either put them uh, put them into an empty boat that we stopped, the one that had room, or in the case of the one we did. Shoot and sink. We, we took the, 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 the natives. I think they were probably all Chinese rather than, they were not Japanese, but they were hauling stuff that was considered contraband. We took them in as close as we could get to the shore of Borneo and put them in, put them on life jackets and sent them in. 
Now, um, how long would a patrol last? Well, the, the first one lasted almost, uh, well, a little over 60 days. That would be about a normal patrol. Mm -hmm. But then you began to run out of food. That was the main limitation. If you hadn't run across any targets and shot off your torpedoes, there was no reason to go back. What about refueling? How often did you have to do that? Um, we never ran low on fuel. I, I had, you know, I read our patrol report and saw how much we burned an awful lot of gallons. But uh, we could easily stay out 90 days with the fuel. And that would be normal kind of running, not, mm -hmm. not a lot of high speed running. Now, what was the longest that you could stay under? A diesel. Well, we we no, had snorkels by this time, right? No, we didn't. Oh, you snorkels. didn't. No, oh. we didn't. The uh, U.S. didn't bother putting snorkels in until after the war. There was no need for them. Uh, we would be, we'd be down all during the day, so that would be maybe fourteen hours or so in the tropics. Then the air began to get a little stale. Mm -hmm. and that, but that's no, nowhere near the endurance. Submarines that were held down with depth charging stay down a lot longer than that. And uh, stay down until it got pretty bad. But we'd notice the, the air getting foul and the pressure would build up inside the submarine just because of air leakage and things. And they opened the hatch and the air goes <laughs> And then the, the, the air, to me, it smelled like ozone. The, the fresh air, almost kind of a sickish mm. smell until you got, got back used to it again. Now, what kind of depths did you cruise at? Well, normally we were uh, probably just a periscope depth, mm -hmm. which would be 60 two feet mm -hmm. so uh, we go down to a hundred feet or so there was no need to go deep we mm -hmm. said we never ran across any uh, any real Japanese warships or we were never bombed mm -hmm. so we didn't have to go deep to, to escape we'd go down to make a test dive uh, what we'd do we had a, an instrument called the bathythermograph which would, would make a trace of the temperature versus depth so you'd know whether you had a layer uh, under a layer of cold water underneath. Well, that was always a, a desirable thing. Why? Well, if you if you were attacked, you'd get down in the layer and they couldn't find you. The layer would reflect the mm -hmm. surface ship sonar, and you'd be much harder to find if you were trying to escape. Mm -hmm. So we would make a, a deep dive probably down to 400 feet every day just, just to get that bath escape, bath the thermograph trace. But um, other than that, normal cruising, periscope depth or a little bit below during the day and at night we'd come up on the surface and we'll search with the radar. Okay, were you on the uh, the lamprey until the end of the war? Right. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I put her in commission and went out of commission. We came back at the end of the third patrol. Well, at the end of the second patrol, we didn't go back to Australia. We went into Subic Bay in the Philippines, which was a very had recently been captured, and the so-called rest camp was just a couple of Quonset huts off in the swamps that you could rest, but that was about, mm -hmm. about it. And so a lot of the fellas would, would hitchhike into Manila, or some of them would, would try to get, get uh, rides on, on some of the uh, patrol planes that were going out and looking for Japanese, or, you know, they'd do, do just about anything. When they were in Australia, they'd go off into the, into the desert. And, We'll try to get around the countryside. But there wasn't that much to do in the Philippines. I did get down to Manila. And, uh, 
my brother-in-law happened to be down there with the army. He was uh, with the, uh, the army engineers that were clearing the port of Manila. And so I, I went down, got a hold of him, met him, and I invited him to come on up to Subic Bay and took him out for a ride on the submarine. <laughs> It's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty liberal about mm -hmm. things. People could bring their friends. When we were in Australia, one of the crew picked up a dog, and we had him with us for the last two patrols, <laughs> and brought him back to the states. The, uh, the fellow, the sailors, taught him to uh, urinate on uh, some of the officers' shoes. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> He never bothered me any. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was a little Australian dingo dog. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I brought him back to the States, and I guess uh, the fellow that owned him got him in all right. Mm -hmm. Some of the other boats had, had kangaroos and parrots and monkeys. They had, they had, I don't know where they, well, they had dogs. I don't know why they had cats, but they could have had anything. Mm -hmm. So most anything went mm -hmm. when you were out there. Now you said one of the most memorable events, I guess inspiring events, was the end of the war. Where were you when, when the well, war ended? Well, that, um, in our third patrol from Subic Bay, we went back to the Java Sea. And we were, we, were go <clears throat> we were lined up to go into a place that was so narrow and, and, and crowded, they called it the bird bath. And we were going to go in there because there was supposedly a Japanese convoy there. There were hardly any big ships left, but, but this was supposed to be some. Anyway, uh, by that time, we got word that the bomb had been dropped, and so everybody knew the war was over. So what did you think when you heard about that? that well, this I one thought, bomb could have... thought that was great, wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, people nowadays forget that there was still plenty of war going on elsewhere. The Japanese still held the whole uh, Dutch East Indies and people were getting killed all the time down there. So um, the uh, submarine that had been built just before us, the Lagardo, uh, actually we'd all been on it for, for training up in the Great Lakes. And she was lost up in the Siam Gulf just about the time we came out. So Many of our, our, our crew knew people on that boat. So it, it was, uh, you know, it was still dangerous, and even though we weren't encountering much, we were going into places that nobody would have been, would have thought of going into at that early part of the war. I mean, the idea of, of chasing sub-chasers and mm -hmm. Going into places called the bird bath. Anyway, we were making an approach on a three-masted schooner when, when I got the word to cease hostilities, and uh, so we had to let him go. <clears throat> of course, I would be a communications officer. Got the got the radio message and took it right into the cabin. Mm -hmm. Now, did you hear about the death, were you on patrol when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Did you hear about that while you were at sea? Yeah, I guess so, or was it, when, when did he die? Prior to the, the dropping of the bomb. I think it was around before, April, was Well, it? before that, yeah. uh, uh, I was thinking, we may not even have been out, of, out into the war zone mm -hmm. yet. Okay, yeah, can't yeah. think of the last exact date. No, I don't recall. Uh, mm -hmm too much about the reaction at that time. Okay. Everybody, of course, was sorry to, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to hear about him, though not everybody was that crazy about Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when you, uh, when the hostilities ended, you were sent back to the States? Well, ultimately. Yes. Yeah. They uh, immediately, we were sent back to Subic. We had been scheduled to go back to Perth, and everybody loved Australia. Mm -hmm. A lot of the sailors uh, actually married girls mm -hmm. in Australia, but uh, we were we were sent back to Subic and uh, tied up with oh must have been twenty subs all tied up alongside the tender and 
waited there for a word what to do, and we finally decided some of them would go up to Tokyo, and some would go back to the States, and some would do. We went back uh, to Pearl Harbor and then back to San Francisco, and we're due for an overhaul, which we, we waited quite a while in San Francisco Bay, and uh, finally went into Hunter's Point Shipyard for an overhaul. And, all of this was, was uncertain as to what, what was going to happen ultimately, but after we overhauled and had the battery changed and some modifications, they decided to put us out of commission. So we uh, took the boat up to Mare Island and put her in mothballs. And I was there from the beginning to the end. Now, do you know uh, what the fate of the sub was? Uh was it eventually scrapped or? Oh, well, the, the Lamprey and a number of the other Manitowoc boats were, were taken out and uh, were brought back into service in, uh, uh, would have been the, the 50s. Mm -hmm. And the Lamprey was given to, to Argentina. It became, I believe it came to Santa Fe. And it was interesting because at that time I happened to be uh, by then, I had be become an engineering duty officer, and I'd been ordered back to back to Hunter's Point. And uh, I was in charge of what they call the sub base, the, the, the submarine overhaul activities. And darned if they didn't bring the Lamprey in to be converted and or reactivated and turned over to Argentina. Hmm. So I briefly got back aboard just before I left left the shipyard. Okay, well, after you uh, returned to the States then and... Well, after the war, uh, we, we had a point system for being yes. discharged, as you probably know. And I, <clears throat> I didn't have that many points, but I had an awful lot of uh, leave time accumulated because we couldn't take any leave all the while I was, was, was out. And so uh, I was just ordered back to home to, to take the leave, which was back here in, uh, you know, my wife's home was back in Clover, New York, across the river. Mm -hmm. So we came back there. I think I had about three months accumulated leave. And while we were there, our daughter was born. And at the end of that, well, wondering what to do, of course, I in and out. Well, I wanted to get out. Then I thought, well, and then I thought, well, I like the Navy. Well, I want to get out. <laughs> and I had contacted a couple of colleges and took, took some tests as to what I might be interested in. And, uh, anyway, I put in for postgraduate. I said, if I get postgraduate course from the Navy, well, I will stay in. And uh, at, at the end of my leave, I was ordered just to report down to uh, Church Street in New York City and wait for the orders. And so they were just doing busy work. And uh, what do I do? I get orders to a new submarine up in Portsmouth, the Spinax. And uh, so I, I hadn't heard anything about the postgraduate. So we went up to Portsmouth and found a place to live and put the put the new boat into commission. The Spinex was a radar picket, something they developed at the end of the war uh, to uh, uh, warn against the kamikazes. Mm -hmm. and these radar picket subs were supposed to be out in front. And they had a lot of radar up on deck, radar pedestals here and there. They were monstrous looking things. And, uh, they had electronics everywhere in the boat. They just, every corner they could find, they had crammed something into it. They called it pro, uh, program migraine, which <laughs> 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 the uh, radar picket conversions. Anyway, this was one of the first ones. But a couple days after it was commissioned, uh, I got orders to MIT. I'd finally gotten uh, one of my the postgraduate choice is actually it's the one I, I wanted the least. It was an electronics course. The captain was mad as 
matter than that. <laughs> I mean, I didn't blame them here. They'd ordered me to, to the boat, and, and uh, he'd have got no use out of me at all. And uh, I, I was just on her for a couple of days after she went into commission. So I, I got, then I was, I then went to MIT, and then Navy sent me to the electronics course there. That lasted. Something like, uh, let's see, 19, well, I got out in 1949, so I was there a little over two years. And I got a, got a second bachelor's degree. It was not a master's degree mm -hmm. course. But, uh, when I got out of that, I was ordered to another submarine, a CCAT, which was down in Panama. And so we, uh, we packed up and ultimately were flown down in a cargo plane. By then, a, by then we had two little children. They put us in this in this cargo plane with bucket seats along the side. All of the transports were tied up in the Berlin airlift. And of course, during this all of this time, the Navy had been cutting back, way back, and. Uh, Ordered, ordered down to the squadron that was based in Balboa on the Pacific side of the Panama Canal. And uh, we flew down in this cargo plane and, and in the morning we'd signed up for a meal, breakfast meal, and in the morning they came by and tossed K, K rations to everybody, including the babies. <laughs> and, uh, I was still wearing my blues because that was the uniform up in uh, where we'd left from, from Massachusetts. And uh, we got down there in as hot as blazes and got a lift over to the submarine base and darn it, if, if the sea cap was not pulling out, they were just casting on the cap and said, jump aboard, jump aboard. <laughs> I said, I can't, we just got here. <laughs> I haven't even got any clothes. <laughs> and so the squadron commander said, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. But they were short-handed. They really needed another officer. And they uh, so said, you stay here long enough to get your household effects, and we'll put you on the next boat going up. <laughs> because uh, there was a, a rather anomalous situation, and they they were based on the Pacific side of the Panama Canal, but the, but their operations were all up out at Guantanamo and Key West. So you'd have to go all the way through the canal and, and go way back up there, for, and you'd be up there for two, three weeks away from your your family. Then you come back for for a couple of week upkeep. So I. I went up on another sub, Diablo, and uh, met the sea cat up in Key West. Went aboard her. I, I again became communications officer and uh, electronics and a whole bunch of subsidiary duties. And uh, at the end of the training, what we would do, we, we were simply op acting as a training boat for. Uh, destroyers at the sonar school. And we'd go out and they'd come out and track us. And it was, you know, very simple stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, very routine and dull. We went back to, uh, went back to Panama and got word, well, no, before we even went back to Panama, we got word they're going to close the base in Balboa, which was a logical thing to do, frankly. And the boats were all going to be scattered, and they were not going to have us go back. Well, here we are, uh, everybody had their family there. And as far as, as my family is concerned, we never did, did get our household effects unpacked. We did get the car. I guess we went back for one upkeep, and then we're back in, in, in Key West again when we got word that we would not go back because the base would be closed. Well, anyway, everybody 
protested, including the commanding officers. So what they let us do, they let the boats swap crews. And, and one of the boats that was going to stay took the single men, and the married men went back on the sea cat and went back down to, to uh, Balboa. And we had to conduct our own upkeep, frankly, because the tender had already left. Anyway, we were able to get our, our families on board uh, an attack transport that they diverted. And uh, it was just, just an ordinary wartime uh, attack transport. For, you know, so what, what did your wife think about all of this? <laughs> well, she'd never been away from New York, and she, she was, she liked, I mean, while, while we were, while she was in, in Panama, I was up in Key West, but her college roommate had married a Spanish fellow from Colombia, and so she took the kids and flew down from uh -huh. Panama to Colombia and saw her, her, her roommate and had, had a, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of an exciting time. We, we saw a little bit of Panama, but, but not enough to, to, to mount anything. But then she, she and the kids came back to uh, Key West on this attack transport. And we got there at the, at the worst time of the year, as hot as blazes. This is before you had air conditioning mm -hmm. much in the houses. And so we, we had this. Uh, we were there almost a year, and then uh, the submarine, well, while we were there, I got over to, uh, we would operate either out of Key West or out of Gitmo, Guantanamo, mm -hmm. and we visited, uh, the boat visited Havana, and it visited uh, Baham, uh, yeah, Bahamas, Nassau, and visited Santiago, Cuba, and of course, Guantanamo itself. And, uh, but the family back in Key West, they just sweltered. Anyway, we got orders to, uh, uh, the boat was going to go to Philadelphia and be overhauled and converted into an experimental submarine. And so we packed up and moved up to Philadelphia. And uh, I had, had a shipyard overhaul and, and they put an experimental sonar on board. It, it was uh, the whole torpedo room, forward torpedo room was simply gutted. Uh, torpedo tubes were there, but uh, you couldn't get to them from inside. We, we loaded them from outside because we were supposed to still, still be able to fire them. Anyway, it was just full of electronics. And, uh, but uh, this time, I had, during this, this time, I had decided to apply for engineering duty. And while waiting for all that to, to happen, uh, we went through this yard overhaul and went back to, back to Key West, but my wife and kids stayed up in New York because it was pretty certain that I wasn't going to stay on there much longer. And indeed, that's what happened. Uh, I got transferred to an aircraft carrier. I was on a uh, uh, escort carrier, the Palau. This was during the during uh, Korea. When just before the uh, Korean War broke out, they were cutting the submarine force about in half, and uh, that's when I decided I, I would wanted to get into engineering duty, which is what I had always hoped for. So that's my interest life. And uh, anyway, uh, when, the, when the war broke out, of course, uh, they, they fired the Secretary of Defense, the one that was cut back everybody, and everything changed. Well, the, the carrier that I got on to, the Palau, was doing training out of, uh, out of Norfolk. We did not get into the, into the Pacific at all. But we would go out for a couple of weeks and uh, I was training the aviators. Must have been really different to go from, must have been quite different to go from a submarine to a, a I know a carrier. It was, because I've never been on the surface yet. Yeah. I, 
I had no particular knowledge, but uh, fortunately they, they took me as an electronic officer, mm -hmm. which I didn't know something about. In fact, it turned out that uh, on the submarines we were a lot, uh, a lot more interested in keeping things going. <laughs> And uh, things were kind of uh, a little bit run down and sloppy on the carrier, and I, I was able to get them straightened out and made some improvements and uh, had a pretty good, good thing in there. Yeah, that, well, that was a, a different. Uh, I, I made some boo boos, but uh, finally got, got my feet on the deck, as it were. It was on the uh, Palau for a year, and, and it took that long for the uh, for an opening to come up in the engineering duty side, and uh, while I was on the Palau, we were based out of Norfolk, so the family moved there. And uh, I got off her in New York. Uh, we were on the way. I guess she was heading up to Boston for a yard overhaul. Anyway, they let me off at New York, of course. Handy enough to me because I always kept my my home address in, in New York. I I'd grown up in Beacon, you know, down in mm -hmm. Dutchess County, and my wife in Claverick a little farther up, and we used that as our home address all of I was in the service. So anyway, I got off the Palau and I had orders out to Great Lakes to the electronics electronic supply office. So there was another complete change, uh, something I had never worked in. Uh, turned out to be pretty interesting. It was during the Korean War. We were on a six and a half day week. Worked uh, all the, well, Saturday mornings. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot about logistics and supply and did a lot of traveling to uh, Companies that were building new electronics equipment, where we would, the, the group I was in charge of would decide what kind of spare parts to buy. And so we were out there for another two years, I guess it was. And I finally got orders for what I'd been hoping for all along, which was to uh, the electric boat company in Broughton, where they were building the Nautilus. Mm -hmm. So we moved to, to Broughton, and I was stationed at the supervisor of shipbuilding there for the next, uh, I guess, almost four years. So the Nautilus was, was just getting started, really, and we were overhauling, we were overhauling and converting uh, well, they were building new submarines, they were uh, converting old ones. I, I got a lot of experience um, on all different kinds of, of subs. Uh, my duties were on the inspection department, and uh, particularly the electronics inspection, but uh, just, just to keep an eye on the electric boat company people, they were doing all the real work. They, Navy people were there to, you know, to observe and direct, but we weren't, we weren't the hands-on mm -hmm. people, we were inspectors, not, not the workers. How much had electronics <coughs> on the, these submarines changed from the time, like, on uh, the Lamprey to, to the, the Nautilus? Not that well. By the, by the time the Nautilus, yeah, things had changed. The, the basic, uh, the basic radar sets were still pretty much the same, although mm -hmm. they were improved models. They were beginning to get some new sonar equipment, which they copied from German models. So, uh, a couple of the boats that we were working on, an electric boat, were what they called hunter killer submarines, and they were. They were basically World War II boat, but they were modified with, with put a big sonar up in the bow, a great big eight-foot thing. 
uh, was a long-range detection sonar. So that, of course, was all new to me. Mm -hmm. uh, they still had some of the, the older sonar was simply an improved model of, of the wartime. Did you have <coughs> more transistorized units and less, well, I think less they tubes? I have not gotten into transistors yet. They were beginning to get into encapsulated circuits, which were uh, still vacuum tubes, but they, they were miniature vacuum tubes rather than the big full-size ones. Mm -hmm. And they'd make up a little circuit and then pack, uh, encapsulate it in plastic. Okay. And you'd replace the whole circuit. But that was, was just the, the latest stuff. And so transistors hadn't really taken over. Um, the Nautilus, of course, was, was one of a kind, and her skipper wanted everything new. He wanted anything he heard about, and he had enough oomph with, with Rickover, and, and he could get what he wanted. So we get, he, he wants this equipment. Well, that's, you, you don't need it. <laughs> well, we want it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I put it on and it was some experimental thing and it would flood out. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I was there when the Nautilus went in commission and uh, stayed there for, well, I didn't. I say I've been on, on a number of, I went out on the Nautilus on, on one of her sea trials. Not the first one, but I think I was out on the second one. I was out on the deep dive. And uh, on a number of the other subs, I must have gone out on six or eight, out on the, the, uh, the trial, test the trial dives. So I got a lot of experience, a lot of different types of submarines. And from, from there, I was ordered to San Francisco, the old shipyard, on the other, other side of the country again. And this is this, this is now what it, what had been the Hunters Point dry docks during the war was now a full fledged shipyard, and they they sent me there to be production analysis officer. Well, here's another. <laughs> what's what's that? <laughs> um, completely new field. Um, uh, I had to had to find out what it was about and what my duties were and. Turned out part of this production analysis was, was uh, controlling the work. Uh, you'd estimate the work before the ship got in there, uh, break it down into job orders, uh, decide out uh, how much people in the shop. It, it had to balance the, the, the workload against the workforce, basically and tell the shops uh, how many people they, they were going to be able to have for the next couple of months. Trying to keep the workload flowing orderly and uh, the yard in balance so you weren't, uh, well, we, we were not trying to make a profit. We were just trying to make sure that we weren't, we weren't spending any more than we needed to. And uh, that was another complete change. And after a couple of years in that, I, I was put on the, the, one of the ships, ship superintendents on the aircraft carrier Ariscany, which was in the papers last week. I don't know if you read it. They, they sank, sank her as a, as a reef, a fish reef off of, uh, off of Florida. I don't know if you noticed it. No. There's a picture of it in the paper. Sort of going down. Well, I while I was on it, we, we converted her, put the angle deck on it, uh, all new equipment, uh, completely modernized her um, into a first line carrier. So that was uh, another complete change of experience. And that, that's sort of my whole career has been like that. From there, I went down to I was ordered to Washington. The Bureau of Ships, they're having a big reorganization, and I got into anti-submarine work. Um, and then I got back into submarine. Uh, from anti-subs back to, to what they called the submarine desk. And I had to organize what they called the Submarine Antenna Improvement Program. 
of all the things we've been complaining about when I was on the subs were still problems. And uh, we set up a special organization to, to try to uh, keep the electronics antennas from flooding out, keep them reliable. So I was uh, in Washington for four years, and then I was ordered back to Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, where I became a quality assurance superintendent. And you say, what's that? Quality assurance is something that we'd never heard of. Uh, we, we considered, uh, well, all they do is they would test everything, of course, and that was considered uh, quality control, but mostly we just said, well, we, we're confident, we've done a good job, we'll take the boat out and we'll go down deep on it. And, uh, well, a friend of mine was, was the skipper of the Thrusher. I'd known him when we, uh, I'd known him when we put the uh, Nautilus in commission, he was one of their officers, and I wrote to him, I said, how about taking me out on, on the thresher? I'd like to see what it's like on one of these brand new boats. Well, he never answered me, and he never came back. Mm -hmm. And that's how I happened to get to Portsmouth, because I had already been ordered to Newport to a destroyer squadron, where I was supposed to be an electronic officer on the staff, instead they shifted me up to Portsmouth to replace a guy that went down on the, th on the thresher. And so I became quality assurance superintendent at Portsmouth, and this is when we were going through all of the big sub-safe ramifications and trying to figure out what had, caught, what had gone wrong on the thresher and making all the improvements. I got into a lot of stuff, x-rays and ultrasonics, all kinds of new things. <laughs> but that's where my career ended. Now is that the section that you mentioned in here was classified, all that work? Um, for what, the, what did I say? About you just that? said that, we asked if you did any oh. unusual duties you said as classified. Was that the kind of work then? And well, uh, the, the, most of the detailed stuff was either confidential or mm -hmm. secret. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, the general type of duty was, was, right. was well enough known. But at Portsmouth, it was more of the same. We'd go out on sea trials with, with the boats once the overhaul was completed. Mm -hmm. um, they were still building new subs there. This was before they took the shipyards out of the construction business. So by the time I left, things were beginning to, to go downhill from my point of view. As far as the, In what ways? Um, well, the, 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 uh, well, for one thing, they were, were starting to, to close down shipyards in, in a big way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so good, good duties were getting, were getting scarce. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, the Navy had built up again during Korea, and it was going down mm -hmm. again. There was always a lot of attrition whenever I came up for promotion, and I was considering myself mighty lucky to have gotten where I did, because I was not an Annapolis man. Mm -hmm. And I'd come in through the reserves, and I'd seen an awful lot of my contemporaries fall, mm -hmm. fail promotion. And, uh, anyway, I, I was just about... I was up for captain at that time, in 1965, and I, I really had considerable doubts whether I'd make it. I think I probably came just below the line. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I, I had always resolved, as soon as I get passed over, I'm going to get out of the service. I'm not going to stick around and wait. You could say and wait for a couple more times promotion, but uh, then you I said, no, if they don't, they, they don't want me anymore, that's fine, I'll get out. 
find a civilian job. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. okay, but I, I have no, no regrets about mm -hmm. my time in the service. I had a wide variety of experience, uh, both afloat and ashore. How do you think your time affected your life? I mean, you know, well, it, it enabled enabled my family to see all travel back and forth across the country, see mm -hmm. an awful lot of the country. I think all my kids got the travel bug, and they now live all over the country. Mm -hmm. They spread all over. Um, we we enjoyed it. We would look forward uh, when we were going to get orders someplace else. We'd talk about, talk it all up in a positive way. Just tell me when it's oh, yeah. okay. And uh, you know, tell hey, great, we're going to go somewhere else. And when we when we get there, we'd immediately see the place. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, we're only going to be there two to three years because that's a normal tour of duty. Right. So we got out to California. We immediately, every chance we got, we'd visit a national park. We'd go here. We, we saw more of the country than the native people did. <laughs> and that was true uh, all of our duty stations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was a positive experience. Did you join veterans organizations after you retired at all? Not right away. Mm -hmm. I, I finally joined the subvets. Mm -hmm. I'm not that much of a joiner. Mm -hmm. But uh, they now have two sub organizations. I belong to both of them. One is, is the Submarine Veterans of World War II, and that does not accept anybody else except World War II veterans, so it's a dying organization. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty well combined uh, with the others, which are the U.S. sub -vets incorporated, and they, they take sub -vets from any place, mm -hmm. any and every period. And now the two organizations work pretty much in hand in hand. Uh, the two of them meet. Uh, the one I'm with meets down in Kingston, and both of them meet at the same time together. So ultimately, the World War II subvets are they're they're already talking about closing up and merging into the other. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, ever stay in contact with any that you served with? I still still write to uh, to several of them. Uh, we went back. Uh, well, was how long ago it was? Maybe it was ten years or twelve years ago, something like that. We we would have submarine reunions, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually went back to four reunions for the Lamprey, and by then. And both skippers had died, and the fellow that was the chief organizer died. And uh, at the last reunion I went to, there were no more than half a dozen of us. So I no longer do that. Mm -hmm. um, they, they still do have reunion. Now all of the boats together mm -hmm. will have a, have a reunion out at Manitowoc, all the boats that were built out there. So I, I got back to a couple of the Manitowoc reunions, so I haven't been back for at least five years. But I, I keep in touch with a couple of people, mm -hmm. but that's about all. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the interview. <laughs> well, it's been a long interview. Yeah.